Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. So for those of you who do not know what Impetus Digital does, is our company has built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. And those tools have helped a lot of the life science companies that we partner with pharmaceutical companies, medical device, biotech companies have their, their advisory boards, their investigator meetings, their co-author working groups doing that virtually. And so we've used our tools to help them. In addition, since COVID-19, we've used our platform to help them with their internal POA brand rollouts, sales and MSL training sessions, et cetera. But more importantly, through all of this, at Impetus Digital, we believe that everything starts with a thought. And then with a thought comes a courageous conversation. And those conversations are the things that we're trying to lead um, with people like Leon Eisen and other leading edge provocateurs, entrepreneurs and other people doing some really leading edge things um, in this space. Um, and that's what we're really trying to do at Impetus and through our podcast and YouTube channel. And at the end of the day, leveraging the Impetus platform to have these ongoing discussions so that we can work on some of these big, hairy, audacious innovations so that we can truly disrupt healthcare as we see it today. So today we're really pleased to have one of these engaging conversations with Dr. Leon Eisen today. He Actually, uh, so happy to have him and so honored to have him here with us today from Israel. Um, Leon began his career as a scientist and he had a dream to advance fundamental science towards helping people. And he then realized that there was a huge gap between pure science and what people really need in their day-to-day -day lives as they manage their, their life. And as a result, he started a new career as an engineer and then he went on as an executive in leading the Israeli medical device startups. And he, he did a few of these. And he's an expert in startup business processes and problem solving, and is the author of not one, not two, but 10 patents and more than 20 publications. He's used his technological background. He's invented the first wrist sensor pulse oximetry monitor without the bulky fingertip sensors that we're so used to using in hospitals and that we see often. And he brings this hospital grade, what we call continuous monitoring of patients to basically the home. And this is where, as you know, a lot of elderly people since COVID-19, we're all in the home. So this is actually becoming the new point of contact. So he's established this company and it's called Oxytone. And we're gonna dig into this a lot more today to understand how we transform this invention into an innovation um, together with the Oxytone team. And he's now working to establish a new model of care that he's calling digital continuous care. So we're gonna wanna really dig into that concept where he's incorporating the modern wearable medical technology with AI powered predicted analytics as a natural evolution of how we're going to be doing remote patient monitoring. So welcome, Leon. So happy to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, happy to be in this uh, webinar and to share my experience, share my view on uh, healthcare in general and my view on post-COVID era, how it will change all our healthcare landscape and it will change dramatically. So thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to check in with you first before we get started. The world is crazy. Um, how are you and family as it relates to COVID-19? Uh, we, uh, I just left US uh, to, to hide from COVID-19 in Israel for the last uh, four months. And I like it. Uh, so we, uh, we, we are well, we're all well here. Actually, last month in Israel, things became uh, very worse. So, but I hope uh, we will solve this problem. A lot of new technology come to the market and coming to the market. You heard about Israeli technology from uh, uh, new drugs, new method uh, of uh, 
patient uh, treatment. By the way, uh, plasma method that was approved by FDA a couple of days ago in the US, here we are using for the last three, three four months already. I, I have friends who did this procedure and just recover it within the week. So this wow. is very interesting, yeah. Good for you and so happy to hear that you and yeah. family and friends are safe and healthy. So that's Thank wonderful. You. So let's dig into this. So excited about this background. So first of all, I just would like to preface this by saying is that Israel, as of the last you know five years, has become a powerhouse for digital innovations and technologies. It's like, you know, the Silicon Valley, you know, of you know, that's going on. Small, in, small, in the <laughs> small Silicon Valley. <laughs> so why, why, what is happening in Israel and what, what has actually helped to attribute to this, this acceleration of digital innovation? Yeah. Oh, a lot of, a lot of uh, things just contributed into this. It's somehow like uh, the full pattern uh, just emerged. Uh, actually, our government help a lot with all grants. So anybody who want to make or start their business has different type of grants they can apply for and usually they get it. Small one, big one. So it's very easy to start a business and get a grant uh, from our government. This is from one side. From another side, people are very well educated. And from other side, it's a, a character of, of people. They like to do something new. They are all involved in some innovations. And uh, that's, that's, that's really a small Silicon Valley very, and driven by the government and driven by the people's uh, uh, character. And it's wonderful to see as well too that you've got a nice, it's nice to see that you've got this nice ecosystem with in investors and other people. And it's really quite frankly becoming many companies becoming internationally acclaimed. So, uh, and Oxytone, which we're gonna get into is, is yeah. probably gonna be on that list. But let's actually start with you first of all, uh, Leon as well. You have a very interesting background and the fact that you received a PhD in physics Okay, tough stuff, quantum computing, you know, quantum, like physics is a, is, is a tough science, but it's not health. So very curious about how you segued your career from a you know, place of academics, from physics into the healthcare space. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so uh, yeah, my, <laughs> my, uh, my background, some kind of uh, simple. I did my PhD in physics and quantum physics and quantum computing. I did my postdoctorate research in laser cooling in quantum computing. And uh, then I understood that, uh, you know why uh, academic uh, people, they have very small salary because what they're doing, people could use in 5,100 years only. So just take this, all years cut salary and you will get small because value they deliver will be good only in 50 100 years and i i, I don't have i don't want to to, to to wait to wait such a long time i don't have a long time a, a lot of time so i decided why not to make value now i have a good experience i have a very good knowledge so i decided uh, to become engineer so i I didn't get into healthcare industry immediately. I became engineer, I became a, a problem solver. I broke in my head how to move from science where we're looking for phenomena and our goal to publish article. It's a good goal, but it's, it's a goal to, to, to the engineering where the goal to build something for people. So I broke in my head how to do it. Finally, I became a freelancer and spent a lot of years on developing and finally i came to medical device area and i was involved with i was lucky to be involved in development incredible devices and incredible medical technologies like core sense the world's first hemoglobin uh, meter non-invasive hemoglobin meter and other devices that's amazing amazing experience and once uh, once uh, my father collapsed on the street, being three years after uh, three hours after discharge from the hospital, 
So I was frustrated, very much frustrated. I, I called his, uh, his uh, physician. Physician didn't know anything, didn't know any information. It was uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I, I understood we have to do something because it's millions and millions of people like my father. And they don't have appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, mm, tools to monitor. So, for example, for example, we are all talking about patient engagement. Let's pay, make patient engagement. Just think how we can engage. If patient 80 years old, 90 years old, engageable at all? No, not at all. But all tools we developed today so far is de are dedicated for, for just uh, average patient grade two, maybe grade three, grade one, in the beginning of disease. But what paradox is that 80% of our money consumed by patient with severe chronic diseases, with very, very severe chronic conditions. But to help them, it's not low hanging fruit. It requires thinking, it requires a lot of money, it requires a lot of development. It's easy to make some software and become billionaire. But this software, how it could help elderly patients? They cannot manage it. So they're not manageable, they're not engageable, so how we can help? So if me or you or somebody else, if we're sick, we can take application, we can make some activity, we can upload data, we can. Uh, if it's 80 years old, 70 years old, great stage three, four disease, heart disease, pulmonary disease, how they can do this? They can't. And what we can offer them? Nothing. And how much money they, can, they consume for us? 80% of all money coming to healthcare. That's all. That's all picture what happens. And this is what I analyzed and understood, and I decided to make difference. And hence the reason, I guess, for the development of oxytone. Exactly. So what, what actually we are doing in oxytone? In oxytone, we are using wearable medical devices, remote physiological data monitoring and personalized, highly personalized data analytics. And we, so, far, so we empower continuous care of patients with very severe chronic conditions so they can live a healthier life. So what does it mean? It means that information from these patients coming to physician or stakeholders exactly in time and convey all needed answers how to treat these patients and how to help these patients. So what we have today in the market, and market is flooded by, flooded by all these devices, spot check monitors, uh, blood pressure monitor, fingertip oximeter. It's just for spot check measurements. It gives you a good picture. So you can understand the, some trend if patient measure once a day, once a week. But if this patient could deteriorate within hours and days, what can you do? And this patient goes to the, uh, to admit it to the hospital. Again, we we'll lose a lot of money by treating these patients. And, and we can just re avoid this. If we have continuous information like in ICU, but from home on these patients, first of all, peace of mind. Second, it's a passive monitoring. These patients do not have to do anything. And third, a physician has all answers. They don't have to call patients. They don't have to make some, uh, uh, some stressful decision. No, they have all answers. They can open, they can have all vital signs like in ICU in hospital, and they can decide immediately what happens. Even we check interesting fact. All alerts today based on, on this uh, point of care monitoring and on threshold, for example, pulse rate too high, oxygen saturation too low, and all people are busy around, caregivers, family members, all busy around because of alert. And we develop very unique artificial intelligence based alert, alert based on uh, personalized, personalized data and history of these patients. And what we uh, found, 
95% of all alerts are false. So 95% of all our time of physician's time spent on a false alert, a nursing time. Same with hospital, by the way. So this is, this is where we are. And what's interesting that COVID helped us to understand this. Because all these problems with elderly patients in nursing homes and uh, long-term uh, care facilities just got to the surface. People die. So we uh, directed our technology to help these people. We deployed in nursing homes. We deployed in uh, care facilities. And we help in nursing home after deployment of our, uh, uh, our product. It wasn't registered any, any death. Uh, Say no readmission for our patients if they are connected all the time. So we can uh, just uh, monitor and treat in real time mild uh, exacerbation happening at home. They don't have to go to, to, go to the patient. So it's an it's, it's incredible solution. But what stop our solution to be implemented everywhere? Again, old mind thinking. Because people should somehow remote patient monitoring. They have to upgrade their processes, their protocols, their business to continuous remote care monitoring. We call it continuous remote patient monitoring. It's a huge industry that belongs to patients with severe chronic conditions who are not eligible for a simple spot check measurements. So this is where, what we're doing. We're doing education. Uh, we are uh, doing webinars and part of our education, our meeting today, because we're going to help industry to turn uh, its face to these patients and to avoid this paradox. Again, paradox that most uh, consuming uh, funds patients have least attention yeah. and least, least tools to manage them. And this is really, really important information, Leon. I think it's extremely important about what you've said, even the target audience being some of the most vulnerable in our communities, which is the elderly, which, as you say, is taking about 80% of our effort, our mind share, our financials, um, and a lot of this is chronic. So I want to kind of dissect each of the things that you've said, because they're all very relevant and important, not just in Israel, but across the globe, because we're all in the same boat, um, is the key thing here is passivity. And the fact that through the hardware and software, people don't have to enter anything in or speak anywhere or do anything specifically, it's passive, which is really essential with the vulnerable of society who may not necessarily have access to certain digital components, et cetera. But I wanna spend a few minutes really on the hardware that Oxytone has developed. As we know, and if you've alluded, there's lots of hardware out there. There's this smart watch and this smartphone and there's this thing and that thing and you know everybody's got something going on. What has Oxytone developed and what makes your hardware differentiated from a Fitbit or an Apple Watch yeah. or anything else that's going out there that's sensorial and passive in nature? Yeah, this is a very important question because all these Fitbit, Fitbit Apple, they created a huge confusion trying to position their devices like uh, medical devices. It's wrong, they are not FDA clear, and they are not built like medical device, and they're not built for these type of patients. Just imagine patient 90 years old with Apple on the wrist, what she can do with this, right? So this is what happens today, and we have to educate people, and actually this is one, one of the questions of our investor, what's the difference and difference very simple. It's like difference between Philips monitor in, in their uh, hospital and just uh, try to replace Philips monitor with Apple, yeah? So based on medical device, uh, physician could decide, physician could prescribe, uh, prescribe drugs and uh, care plan. And if physician does it based on uh, Fitbit, if something happens, he can go to jail. 
even insurance will not help. So this is the first. Second, uh, I'm not talking about wearable. Uh, people think that it looks like watch, it's wrist, it's wearable device. So immediately they confuse with Apple and Fitbit. It's not wearable, it's medical device. So we take all medical devices like in hospital from the hospital shelf and put on wrist almost all we continue to add more and more vital signs. And uh, so it's not wearable, it's a medical device, but it's happy to be wearable medical device. So it enables patients uh, to wear it 27. I don't know another approach to, uh, to manage uh, uh, patients and to, to take their vital signs. Maybe next stage it will be implantable. Today it doesn't exist. So we have only wearable, only one way to, to uh, collect data from patient continuously and every day and daily. No other way, it should be chest patch or some any patch. It should be a wrist monitor. It can be a arm, upper arm monitor. It can, can be head monitor. That's all. And so this is where we are. And you've mentioned with the oxytone sensor that you've got the, the top of the wrist ulnar bone concept. And I don't know if that's a differential yeah, as well, where yeah. that fits in. But you also have a patent on something called trans illumination optical technology. Where does that come into play? Why does it make your hardware different, better, more efficient? Can you explain about how that, how that fits with the oxytone hardware? Okay, first of all, we have to compare with something. And something, uh, there are only three companies in our world having FDA for pulse oximetry at wrist. And we are only on the market today. So you can go and buy our product like organization. We do not sell it to consumers. So the main difference that ulna bone is only place where you, you can accurately measure blood oxygen saturation. It's very difficult parameter to measure. It requires some specific location, specific sensor configuration, and we got FDA clearance world first. So we did something world first, and I am proud about this. It's world first innovation. And uh, the main difference that we use elastic sensors that embed or how to K uh, that takes all the bone. So the device looks like this. So it takes all the bone, placed around all the bone. And all sensors are flex, elastic. We call it flex sense technology. So why, how it influences on accuracy? First of all, because it's elastic, it follows the shape and dynamic shape of the wrist. So all the time it embraces all location around the ulna bone. And second, because it's elastic, it doesn't uh, affect the local blood flow. Because if you take any other sensor in the middle of wrist, they are rigid. You never saw a sensor like uh, Oxyton. They are rigid and they just press the skin. So blood goes out from the skin and data is very noisy and you cannot measure correctly. So, and the third uh, reason of ulna bone, it resembles forehead where you have the best medical devices. So we have very, very thin skin and we have the bone that is natural light guide. And that's why we call it trans illumination technology because it just guides the light from between one sensor to another sensor to, uh, to gather the data. And data is very, uh, very uh, accurate. No, almost no noise because all noise just get lost on, on, on the path between two sensors. So that's all. So this technology enables to measure a lot of a lot of things because we have the clear signal. But what we are doing now, we understood that such a technology could, could be very valuable in different places as well. Now we're working on another device on upper head. Not all people happy to wear something on wrist. So we offer them uh, upper hand, but it's the same technology. So elastic technology that doesn't affect local blood flow and doesn't uh, degenerate the signal. Same, uh, we think now, so we didn't start yet, but we found how to measure at the uh, finger to make some kind of ring. 
but actually again this is medical devices this is not some wearable health or something like this it's pure medical device like in hospital very nice. So what's interesting about the Oxytone solution is you're a hardware software play, right? So it's not like you just created software and then you were agnostic with any device. You're actually going in as a double play. Now, the Oxytone software helps to measure a variety of metrics, including respiratory rate, temperature, motion, sleep, pulse rate, um, you know, HRVs, a lot of things, a lot of other, other uh, hardware measures as well. But in addition, you also measure oxygen rates and fall detect detection, which as we all know is one of the number one reasons that the elderly have comorbidities and issues and, and really quite frank frankly, death. So can you speak a little bit about what you've built into the software what makes it unique and different? And more specifically, the AI algorithms that you have built that actually paints a story in a, day, in a way that might be different from other competitors in the market. Okay, thank you for the question, it's very interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, today our software is agnostic to devices. So uh, because some people have comorbidities, so we added uh, scale we added blood pressure monitor so people could uh, could have some integration or combination of continuous monitoring or spot check monitoring because there is no uh, blood pressure monitor for continuous measurements so uh, what interesting in this software that this software specifically designed for continuous patient monitoring uh, usually all software are designed for like a point of care to take data, evaluate it, to apply some analytics algorithm. You have to measure for the year to, to get enough statistics and then to understand what happens. Yeah. In our case, even uh, any electronic health record, they're not eligible. They cannot uh, collect continuous data. And I ask, I don't know about today, but uh, half of a year ago, I tried to connect to health kit. They cannot accept uh, continuous uh, blood oxygen data. They are not, they're not made for this, that's all. So we, one of their, our initial uh, entrance into AI, how we do alert. I just mentioned about alert before, but now I can just get deeper into this, dive deeper into this stuff because it's very interesting. Because uh, most of alerts are false alert based on some one time threshold penetration or something like this. Yeah, and physician put threshold usually on, on all measurements to get some alert. But physician just, when we start to talk to physicians, start to educate them, they afraid that alert comes all the time. So they have all the time to watch continuous data. They're afraid to, to have continuous data. And I just explained, it's totally opposite now. You can leave it, leave the patient until there is a load. It's like when you watch your kids before era of smartphone, you should all the time take a look for the window where are your kids. Today, you don't have to do it. You have peace of mind. You can call them if you want. This is the main difference. The same here, peace of mind until there is a load. And now about a load. It has five levels of emergency. So it go up in emergency level. And all if only if all these five levels of emergency went uh, through, there is a lord on notification that goes to caregiver and, uh, and uh, stakeholder. And this could be within five minutes. It could take hour, it depends, but we develop very specific alert based on correlation of all these data. So if there is a first uh, emergency call, some uh, inner, in, within the algorithm, emergency call algorithm start to correlate of all vital signs. So it starts from, for example, looking situation, uh, just broken threshold, it's some low level alert, nothing happens, just all system is an emergency state and all systems start to correlate or well, all vital signs. The simple example, uh, usually patients with COPD, if they move, their oxygen saturation goes down, pulse rate goes up. If they don't move, so it's a routine, it's okay. If they don't move, but oxygen saturation goes down, 
oh, that's, that's a sign of the problem. And, and if this continue for some time, it's sign of real problem. So this way we can uh, understand what happens and make alert. And then physician could unlock this data in real time and watch like in ICU. So we, we uh, uh, separate all data uh, in hours. So it's one cube is each hour, 24 hours is each, each day. So physician could add into this and could open this data with one second resolution. So it covers a uh, screen, a uh, number of pixels, your screen re resolution, and you can find what happens inside. And also we give data about hypoxia index, apnea, activity change. So if there is some change that leads to this alert and there is some problem, in time, physician could decide about change, optimize care plan, optimize drug delivery, or even take patient in the emergency room and depends on patient state. But usually all these dedicated to avoid emergency room and uh, readmission, if make it in time. Very interesting. And so also I would like to add, yeah, I would like to add very interesting stuff. Today I talked to uh, one uh, people, uh, to people uh, I had some conversation and it, it was interesting uh, observation. They said, what you did is you have medical device and added uh, some wellness features like activity uh, uh, to measure medical status of patient. What uh, wellness devices were doing, they take wellness features and try to make them medical. <laughs> This is the main difference. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere down the line, we'll all converge into one place, I think. So, so very interesting. And, and so I want to bring up a couple of topics as it relates. So we talked about the hardware. We talked about the software. And we talked about the ability for continuous monitoring and this uh, opportunity for the prescribers or the, the, the watchers, if you will, of the patient's health over time um, from a dashboard and, and receiving these alerts. So there's a couple of questions that come to mind as it relates to the physician. One, physicians are always complaining that they don't have enough time. So is there an issue, and I know you've kind of alluded to this, about how this, and, and in addition, we're asking physicians to change their skill sets going from the empathetic, you know, caring, speaking to a patient and talking about health to in some ways becoming a data scientist, having to understand the tableaus or the visual uh, view of a patient's health using statistics. How is the pushback or the acceptance of this um, when we're talking about a dramatic change in the way physicians do their work and then the other question, and so yeah, so I'm just going to ask that is, is there an adoption issue? Um, because this is, this is a, a step change away from the way we traditionally run medicine. I start from the second question. Uh, yes, there is a real problem of adoption. That's why we educate our customers all the time, because uh, the most uh, problem of adoption belongs to change of some protocols. For example, our product is very good to reduce hospital stay. So you can send patient home immediately and uh, get uh, him uh, um, measurements or every, like in hospital every day. Yeah? So you don't have to keep patient in the hospital. And for COPD patients, it's a, an average six, seven days. That's very costly. But it requires change of all, pro not only mind, mind, mind it changed protocols. Mm. So this is quite uh, costly in the beginning. And if people do not think about future, how they will solve the problem, they don't have time to change. And COVID-19, it's also another paradox. Uh, COVID-19, uh, people so busy, they don't have time to change anything. And so adoption, does not is not uh, such a uh, quite fast thing but in any case it happens with all, any new devices any new industries so it's, it's exponential growth so now we're in the first 
first quarter uh, of, of this growth and we'll see what, what will happen. Many co other companies enter into this market. Uh, answer to the second question, the uh, first question, I have a very interesting story. One physician asked us to, to check uh, uh, different patients, different cohort of patients. One cohort of patients are very compliant and very annoying. So they all the time come to the meeting, they call every day, they disturb physician, physician know everybody in, in, in name and remember what happens there and physician really think that he keeps this patient out of the hospital because for the last two years they, they weren't in the hospital, not, not admitted. He's happy about it and proud about his work. And another cohort of patients, you never heard about them, never annoying, looks very, uh, very uh, uh, not depressed at all, very, very good. And they twice a year in the hospital with exacerbation or something like this. So what happens? We did investigation of this, we have results. And what investigation found, that first cohort of very annoying patients, any guess? They're totally, not totally, but relatively good relatively healthy. But their mood like this, their character like this, they annoying, they like all the time to talk to physician and physician put all our money spent, yeah? And spend all his time for these patients because he thinks if they call you every day, it means they need something. And the physician proud keeping this patient out of the hospital. But I told this physician, it's not because of you they're not in the hospital. <laughs> because they are relatively healthy. And it was not only surprise, this physician was just broken even, I would say. So he said, what? So I said, okay, take our product and make baseline for each patient. And then you will understand whom you have to pay attention. And then you will have it automatically and you will save your time and you will optimize time of your staff. Yeah, I think that's actually brilliant because as we all know, we're all given the same currency of time. You have the same amount of time, physicians, Warren Buffett has the same amount of time. It's just what we do with that time. So I think that is brilliantly said of how to use that resource and that your product not only saves dollars as in dollars and hospitalizations and things, but also physician time and peace of mind as well. So I think that's key. You also alluded to the fact, um, Leon, is that the there's a whole protocol process. As we all know, we're human beings. We're conditioned to go into automaticity mode. We like to do things that are habitual, that are easy, that doesn't require a lot of mental activity and learning. And um, that's why we go into what the, our neural networks are what we're used to. So learning requires a whole bunch of energy and doing and changing things. Protocols, hospital changes. The other big question comes down to interoperability. So we're talking about your device, but this is in the midst of an ecosystem of multiple devices, especially in the new normal post COVID where everybody has gone virtual, Bluetooth, multiple different types of sensors, passive or otherwise. What does this mean for Oxytone in terms of managing in this crowded ecosystem, everybody inching towards the institution's electronic health records or whatever is going to suddenly get into the frontage, right? Who's going to be in the front? And, you know, because everybody's vying for physician attention. What is Oxytone doing on that subject and where does interoperability fit within your model? So actually, we are a standout uh, from other devices, as you understand. So for us, it's easy to, to, to find market positioning, exactly market position and educate and penetrate into the market because uh, we explain exactly what uh, what I explained today. We explain to physician, we explain to our customers. So we just compare, take fingertip oximeter and give it to patient 90 years old. What do you think will happen? And take our oximeter and put on your uh, hand for a couple of days and take a look what will happen. They immediately understand the value. So today in all um, home monitoring, about 10% of all patients, patients with very severe chronic conditions. And they require the same uh, very, very uh, continuous monitoring, I, I would say. And they don't have the, these. 
And now, because of COVID, it become very clear what happened. So we have clear positioning. We offer our devices to integrate into their existed, uh, exist, existing platform. We do not say just take your platform, our platform, like separate platform for continuous monitoring. No, you can integrate our device directly via Bluetooth. And this is what happened with ASCOM, for example. ASCOM selected us uh, within, uh, among other many, many devices, uh, mostly spot check monitors, definitely, for COVID-19 patients. So we are integrated into their uh, patient surveillance system. And we are our device in, just part of the kit, the temperature, all this stuff, but this is for continuous data. And continuous data flow through their hub to their cloud. So they watch this, they understand how to get continuous data and they ha they're happy about this. So ASCOM is the biggest European telecommunication company delivering these uh, uh, services for COVID-19 patients. So this is one example. Another example, some companies, they are looking for using our technology because we have some feature that, that they don't have in the software, for example. And uh, by the way, our software enables to update the uh, device operational system that cannot happen through other software, uh, third path software. So they take our all our cloud, we give them some kind of tenant. We call it tenant, so it's their name, it's a white label, like Microsoft, you know. They, we don't have any access there, it's a HIPAA compliant, GDPR. They have the cloud in Azure, and they could keep the data for the patient, because our um, cloud is very easy to use, it's straightforward, it's not like electronic health records, very straightforward, uh, data, data oriented. And uh, they also could apply API and transfer data to their platform. This is what happens, for example, with our partnership with Sigma. Uh, so we are open to any type of integration and uh, it depends on customer, customer feels. So we have a lot of people in our following that are in the pharmaceutical medical device um, who may be very interested in potential partnerships, et cetera. So there's a myriad of ways potentially, and I was wondering if you could speak to this. One is companies may want to partner in terms of extending patents, um, extending what's going on with either drugs or with their medical devices. They might be reaching end of, you know, loss of exclusivity. And by adding an extra dimension, they could potentially increase the length of time of their patent. Now, as you know, with the NIH and the FDA and all sorts of other health organizations, they've accelerated in the modification and the acceptance of these devices, software as a medical device or these you know, digital therapeutics. Um, you know, I was wondering how Oxytone is, is positioning itself potentially to be a digital therapeutic that physicians or prescribers will go in into a digital pharmacy and prescribe this, this hardware software uh, as, as a measure. Um, and so that's one angle as it relates to the partnerships. But pharma companies might also be very interested in partnering as you are accumulating real world evidence for clinical studies, for evaluation, for new drug discovery or opportunities for discovery. So, there's a lot of aspects to this. I was wondering if you could speak to the partnership opportunities, you know, sharing things like data lakes for discovery and clinical studies, and then also the eventuality of including Oxytone as a, uh, you know, as a device or a digital therapeutic in, in the future. Yeah, thank you. You raised a very important question. We just recently, uh, 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 started uh, to our interest, uh, launch our interest uh, towards uh, to, to work with Hero and Pharma. Uh, pharma may be even more uh, more uh, conservative than physicians. It's very difficult uh, to get into the pharma. It's like like closed closed uh, uh, community uh, society. But we try, we try. We don't have yet uh, any customer from pharma, but uh, for the last month I, I was uh, speaking with many of them. They are all interested. 
But again, they have to have specific protocol for these. And not a lot of pharma looking for uh, some pulmonary diseases. I can just number of companies do, doing something for pulmonary diseases, drugs for pulmonary diseases, AstraZeneca. So you can number these. And uh, so we are working with them. We, we have a dialogue, but we're not there yet. I understand and everybody understands the huge impact that our product could make on decentralized uh, pilots. So we can send device everywhere in the world so it can build a centralized pilot. But even the centralized pilots, it's on the beginning uh, of the industry. So actually this is what happens. But our main market positioning that using our product First of all, uh, pharma will be able to get any answer or feedback from the patient body in a second after patient took the pill, in an hour, in a day, so they can follow exactly what happens. And they could uh, understand even be before spending one billion dollar and get it to the phase three, what happened to patient because they have exact information directly uh, after taking the pill. Or, compliance problem, patient didn't take the pill. For example, we, we uh, did investigation and we built patient, how looks patient baseline if patient forgot to take CPAP, for example, at night. How sleep apnea started to grow or uh, forgot to take some pills, how baseline changes. So we can learn these, apply AI and exactly understand what kind of non-compliance or uncompliance happens. So this is the future, we're just in the beginning, but this is what our technology enables to do. Yeah, and I, and I think it's very relevant, and I think you s spoke about it very succinctly, that these are some of the, the advantages of pharma partnering with Oxytone very much for these reasons. Uh, real world evidence, clinical studies are becoming the norm and the requirement. Um, and so being able to utilize tools like yourself, you also mentioned adherence is, you know, is always an issue. Um, so being able to integrate those into their programs um, and also utilizing uh, your, your uh, program and your, your software for patient support programs, sort of integrating this as part of the monitoring system. So there seems to be a lot of angles and interesting opportunities there. Now, you also, as you've mentioned, are a storehouse of continuous data. And data is the new oil. It's also potentially a very touchy subject and of concern to many, many people because of security and because of ownership and what should I share and what do I own, et cetera. One of the concerns, of course, is potential partnerships because you can see how you know, uh, employers or more importantly, insurers would be very interested in your data from a predictive analytics standpoint. What cohorts or what kinds of patients are going to be of concern and how do we manage all of these things in the future? This is of concern to when it comes to population health management. How do you sort of speak to security, data privacy, who gets what, and that the, this whole concern around, wow, insurance companies are going to get access to this, you know, it's going to change the trajectory of my choices as a healthcare consumer or as a patient. Well, it's a very important question because security, we, are plan we plan to make our platform the most secure as possible. And we plan to, to, to have this as one of their uh, differentiator and one of the feature. And this is what we're working on. So we have GDPR, we have HIPAA, and now we move in the HIPAA ladder, you know, all this ladder up and up to, to, to add more and more secure, secure features into our platform. Because here for continuous monitoring, it's very important because we collect a lot of data. You, you're right, it's, a, it's really a warehouse, warehouse of, of data. And uh, so security is very important. That, that's why we selected Azure. We think it's the most secure platform, Azure for healthcare. We like it very much. And uh, so this is one of our priorities, security. And uh, for, for patients, Again, for patients, we have very secure, secure Bluetooth. We have very secure transmission and application. For example, in application, all data stored and coded, specifically encoded. So nobody could, could that they get this data. All transmissive protocol is very much secure. So I'm not sure it's possible to add, uh, to, to, to pay it possible, but I don't know, it should be very difficult. And uh, also, 
uh, when we uh, give our clients tenant, tenant is very much secured uh, in a part of our cloud in Azure. And there is uh, many uh, levels of verification of physician. So there is verification of physician, there is verification of admin of this tenant. We don't have any access inside. And we, we only could collect statistics, for example, how many patients and how many measurements happens, but we don't have, we don't know who is the patient, uh, what kind of data, no any. So this is done in aggregate, so people having concern about insurance companies having access to their information wouldn't get it at an individual level is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. So one of the other concerns that often, especially since you're speaking very eloquently about the large cohort that this really caters to is the elderly, the vulnerable, people in nursing homes um, and, and, and the like. There's always a lot of discussion about the digital divide and being able to have access. This is not as much of a concern as it's more of a hardware, you know, something sitting on your wrist type of sensor. But is there ever a concern around access and reimbursement and who technically is paying for this, these products? especially if you start to endeavor in doing clinical studies with your, with your model and being able to determine clinical outcomes of patients who do not use oxytone and then looking at another cohort of people and their outcomes who do. And as you start to accelerate that, maybe move it into a clinical study and then actually get a designation as a de digital therapeutic, as, as just like a drug, um, is there going to be a, a, um, a protocol or a process put into place to start thinking about reimbursement and who, who is going to have access and is there going to be access for all? Yeah. That's a good question because actually reimbursement is our headache, but finally we understood we don't have to, we don't have to care about it at all. Actually, uh, there is a lot of reimbursement for RPM, remote patient monitoring. The main problem that the same reimbursement if patient has continuous monitoring or spot check monitoring or for 16 monitoring, not continuous monitoring, spot check, 16 days. So actually they could buy a device for 15 or $20 and have the same reimbursement like for our device, 300 or $400. So, uh, and I think at this stage, uh, it's very difficult to solve this problem because uh, there is no reimbursement for such devices. It's, it requires a lot of money and a lot of effort to get reimbursement specifically for such devices, multi-parameter devices, I would say, because reimbursement for some uh, using pulse oximetry for CPAP or something like this, but not for multi-parameter. There is some very uh, small reimbursement for patients with uh, complex diseases through the DME. It happens, so they could get reimbursed. Uh, but most important that there is no somehow a straightforward reimbursement for our device. But there is another side of this, uh, of this solution about reimbursement because this device uh, help, uh, to, uh, help to, uh, to re reduce spend money spent and uh, uh, have very good return of investment. So we decided to uh, enter into value-based care. And uh, you know, there is a contract between healthcare uh, systems and insurance company about value. And this is exactly why there is a future of such technology because also to, this technology embraces the future of the healthcare through not an endorsement, through value-based sharing return of investment. And this is where direction we decided to, to go. And this is what we're working on today. And I think uh, their uh, issue is much bigger than just $100 reimbursement out of RPM or reimbursement for device that I have friends, they invested, I don't know, $50 million just to get reimbursement for their device. That's crazy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Sounds like a really great route. Um, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't end this interview with asking about another interesting endeavor that you have personally conducted. And that is you founded something called Startup Health. And you actually partnered with GE, actually, and you've helped incubate at least, I think, 13 healthcare startups. So very exciting, I guess, in Israel. 
So I was actually just curious, based on that work that you're doing with those, those as the, in that incubator with those startup companies, what are some of the hopes that you have for digital technologies, for AI, for remote or ambulatory care or monitoring? What is your hopes for the future based on this, this entrepreneur ecosystem that you've been accelerating? Well, first of all, I didn't found the uh, startup health. It's uh, Howard, uh, Howard and uh, other people, Crane, Howard Crane, other people, they started startup health. We were within the first cohort of startup health companies in partnership with General Electric seven years ago. So they believed in our technology. They shared my view on, on a future of uh, digital health. That's why even being in, in the early stage, even in idea stage and the first very, very ugly prototype stage, we were accepted into the startup health. Like uh, I, I was accepted like healthcare transformer. And today the cohort of startup health company grow to 300 plus companies. So it's, it's an incredible society, incredible people. I like it. Every week we, uh, we have some, uh, a meeting on Zoom and share our ideas. So that's amazing. So I think that future of digital health is quite understandable already. From point of uh, view of measurements, I think everything goes to two types of devices. First, implantable devices. I think wearables is just some uh, intermediate stage towards implantable. And, and our devices will be non-contact devices. By the way, interesting, uh, Cleveland Clinic launched some uh, contest uh, about uh, non-contact devices or very low contact devices. So like early sense, for example, some pad, pad to measure patients at night and others. So these two directions will be in the future of digital health. So how we generate data out of the patient and, and then it will be software that will enable apply uh, augmented intelligence. I do not believe so much in artificial intelligence in the healthcare because I, I will never go to make surgery based on what a robot told me. Uh, I, I want to meet with a physician for this. But in any case, I'm talking about augmented intelligence that will help the physician to decide. And this is the future. So from one side, we have some very new types of, of how we, uh, kind of devices we collect the data. And from software side, we will have augmented intelligent tools to generate, uh, to generate uh, appropriate answers based on this data. Beautiful. Leon, I could actually literally speak to you for hours. We're at the top of the hour. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today. What you're doing at Oxytone is revolutionary. It's exciting. We love having these conversations for the pharmaceutical companies or other uh, healthcare companies that are interested in contacting Leon for potential discussions or partnerships. We will be tagging him with his contact information. So please reach out. And also if you're interested in these kinds of conversations, um, Impetus actually has some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual tools. We are the bridge for going beyond just your brand discussions. If you're wanting to talk to other provocateurs and, and leading edge thinkers, getting your physicians, your payers to start talking about things beyond the pill, that's exactly what Impetus does and what the vision is for our platform to be the bridge for these big, hairy, audacious conversations. So thank you again, Leon, for a fantastic discussion. We wish you so much success with Oxytone. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you to our audience who attended today. We wish you a wonderful day ahead. Thank you very much, Natalie. And I, I hope we will uh, meet again soon. Thank, thank you very you much. So much.